message that I've entitled Beautiful Bethlehem. Beautiful Bethlehem. We'll be looking at the text, the prophet Micah in chapter 5. We'll read verses 1 and 2. And I'll ask you to stand just in honor and reverence to the reading of his holy inerrant infallible word. Micah says, Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem, Euphrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Father, this morning we just pray that you take us in your arms, Lord. And Father, just do that, that only your spirit can do. Thank you, Lord, for the move of your spirit already this morning. And Lord, we pray for a refreshing in the word. And God, we pray to grow in grace and knowledge of you. And Lord, I ask you to touch every person here. Let them see what you intend, God, with this message as our prayer. We'll give praise to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. And you can be seated. Our world today that we live in is a world that's full of immoral, corrupt leaders and governments all over the nations. And always have been. When you look back through history, you'll find that uh, some of the most devastating type of wars, people being slaughtered, I mean, just maliciously slaughtered in all kinds of ways. And even in the uh, last century, the, the 20th century, we find some of the great wars, World War I, World War II, the things that we've seen, great atrocities that happened because of just the ideology of mankind. Mankind has a difficult time getting along with one another. But here in this passage that we see, this prophecy that Micah gave, we see that he is telling us that yes, things are bad, but things are going to get better. Things are bad, but there's one coming. There's one coming who's going to take care of all this. And I maintain for you today that that one did come. He come and he brought peace to this earth. Matter of fact, you'll find in Luke, he says, the angel says, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That's what God brought to us. The problem is man has not picked up on that yet and they have not reached a place to where they are comfortable with letting that be their life. It's just not their life. Everybody is so frustrated, everybody's so confused. And it seems like that nobody really, really wants to be true when it comes to really honoring and serving a true and a living God, especially nations. Nations, it, it, it's, it's just atrocity how that some leaders in some nations will do. Lead people totally different from the way God would have them. Because you think, well now, surely people are still not worshiping idols. Well, if you go look into some of the middle, some of the far eastern countries, you'll find they got idols sitting everywhere. And you don't think they're worshiping those idols? Yes, they are. All these different gods, they got them carved out and figured. And I thought, how, how can that be? How blind can men be that they're still sitting, looking at that and thinking that that is some going to give them some kind of reprieve and some kind of help whenever it's nothing but a piece of stone or a piece of wood. But I'm telling you today, there's, there's some things that's happening now. This, this passage, the Micah is prophesying the coming ruler of God's kingdom. He's prophesying the coming of the Messiah, which was central to this whole earth and whole creation. Now, just a little bit of, a little bit of uh, background here. You'll notice that he, he, he tells us in, in verse 1 there in the prophecy, he says, O gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. 
they shall smite the judge of Israel, <coughs> excuse me, with a rod. Micah is giving some predictions that's going to happen in about a hundred years from this time. Babylon came and took over and overrun Israel, laid siege to them. And if you'll go back in the Kings, you can find that, that Zedekiah was there as king and they laid siege and actually famine took place in Jerusalem. They actually build mounds and stuff like that to build up to get over the walls. And sometimes those sieges lasted for a couple of years before they actually overrun the city. So there was a lot of starvation. But Michael was saying what was going to happen. Now what actually happened to, to, to the king of Judah whenever this took place was that he and some of the men run out of the city, tried to flee. And the leader of Babylon caught up with them. And they caught Zedek and they took him and killed his sons in, in his, front of his eyes. And then they poked his eyes out completely, made him blind, took him captive whenever they went into Babylonian captivity. So they were sent, so Michael was given a prophecy that was going to fix it to happen. Then he was given one far off. You notice that because in, in verse two, it begins with, but thou, Bethlehem. Notice this, thou, Bethlehem. Now notice it says, because even though you're little among the thousands of Judah, yet he says, out of thee shall one come forth unto me that is to be the ruler of Israel. In other words, this is a, this is a prophecy concerning Jesus Christ, where Jesus Christ is going to be born. Now that little, that little town there outside of Jerusalem, Bethlehem, was a small town, was the place where that the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, was to be born. Now here's what that says to me. It says that you may feel like you're small here this morning. You may feel like there's not much going on in your life. But if, if little Bethlehem was good enough for God to bring forth the, the Son of God in through him, then you are good enough or, or you're worthy enough in God's eyes for the Son of God to live in you and live through you. So don't sell yourself short just because sometimes you feel like you don't measure up. We don't measure up, but when God puts his saving grace on us, his grace allows us to measure up to God. Measure up for him because we are, we are set apart in the Lord Jesus Christ and we're to him. Now then, in doing some research, I did some looking for some unusual births. I got a couple of unusual births I want to tell you about. On two, two different occasions, I found that there was twins born. But they were born on different days, different months, and different years. But they were still twins. They were born like 26 minutes apart. One of them born December 31, and the next one born on January the 1st. They were twins, but they were born in separate months, separate days, separate years. That's kind of an unusual birth. <coughs> one lady I'd read about had three children. The first child born to them was born on August, which is the eighth month, the eighth day of 2008. So their birth date was 8808. The second child was born. Their birth date was September the 9th of 09, which made their birth date 999. And then their third one was born. Lo and behold, this child was born October 10th of 010. So there, all her children was, when you, when you line it up, it looks so odd. You think, how could that happen? But those are unusual things that happen. Let me tell you something that's unusual when it comes about the birth that came forth out of Bethlehem. For that birth to be of a virgin, <coughs> that was unusual. That had never happened before. And by the way, don't you never let anyone get into your brain and mess your thinking up when it comes to the virgin birth. The virgin birth has to be. Without the virgin birth, there is no Christianity. The virgin birth is why Jesus was born without sin. He was the only one ever was born that way in this earth. And he is the only one who was able to pay the sin debt for mankind. So don't you let anybody tell you the virgin birth is not important. It is. 
it is what Christianity hangs on. And, and that's what you're... Now, look here. I want us to notice this morning three things that's important, the important truths that I want to apply to this, this message right here today. The three things I want you to hear. First of all, his birth in history. His birth in history. Luke, the angel, told that he would be called the son of God. This, this child that was to be born, that he would be called the son of God. And Jesus was born into this world and not from it. That's something that I need for all of us to remember. That, that he was born into the world and not of this world. See, he is not a man becoming God. But he is God incarnate. God coming into human flesh. Coming into it from outside. You've got to understand that. You've got to understand that. Now hang with me. I'm going to try to make a point right here. And if you can get a hold of the point I'm trying to make, it may, it may could very well change your life as to how you look and how you think and how you live when it comes to knowing the Lord Jesus Christ and living in Him and trusting in Him. Now, John 1.14, we find, we find this. That the Bible tells us that the Word, that's the Logos, the Word of God was made, was, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And the Bible says that we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Notice, full of grace and truth. Jesus came as the Word of God. He came in the flesh and He came full of grace and full of truth. Now what is it we need today in our life? We need grace and we need truth. We don't need our doctrines built on some kind of falsehood. We need truth. We need to be solid upon the Word of God. And the Bible is God's Word. There's a lot of supposition going around today. There's a lot of people having all kinds of ideas about different things and they, they assume certain things but they have nothing to stand on. I'm going to tell you, the Word of God is sure and it'll stand when the world's burning. The Word of God is sure and it'll stand, and stand for sure. Now, so we see his birth in history. This Bethlehem that sprung forth, even though they were small, even though Bethlehem was small, you, you remember, that's where Ruth met Boaz. And Boaz fell in love with Ruth and eventually... David came along the line and David, one after God's own heart, the man after God's own heart was born in Bethlehem. And you'll find that Christ was to be of the seed of, of David. So it's a likely place to where the Christ would be born. Where does that be at? It would be in Bethlehem of Judea. So Bethlehem, Jesus stepped into our history out of Bethlehem. That, that's where he stepped into to, to, to our history there. Now then, the second thing I want you to notice with me is his birth, his birth in you. Now here's what I want you to understand. I'm reminded of what Paul has said when he was writing to the Galatians. The Galatians was about to turn back into Judaism or trying to mix Judaism and Christianity and Paul was concerned about that. In Galatians 4.19 he wrote and he said, My little children of whom I travail in birth again until what? Till Christ be formed in you. Now what's to be formed in us? Christ is formed in us. What is Christ? Christ is Logos. He is the Word of God. Christ is grace and truth. So what's being born in you? What's being formed in you is grace and truth. Why is it we have such a hard time struggling with flesh? Because flesh don't want grace and truth to dwell in you. So therefore, it, there's a struggle constantly between my old flesh and what the Spirit of God wants in me. And I have to understand that there's something great happened in the heart of those that has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb of God. It's more than religion. It's more, it's more than just something I get up every morning and try my best to do. No, it is the very life of God Himself living out through His people. John 3, 7 
Jesus told Nicodemus, said, don't marvel when I tell you, you must be born again. In other words, don't think it's strange. Now I'm gonna say to you, don't you let it be something that, that bothers you when you realize, you know what? I must be born again. Now, I'll say to you, bold-faced here this morning, according to the Word of God and upon the authority of God's Word, if you have never been born again of God's Spirit, you are not saved. You, you don't belong to God, and you'll be lost eternally if you have not been born of God, born from heaven, born from above. God's Spirit is living in you now, dwelling in you. And that's the thing that is so hard for us sometimes to get. I'm convinced that this nation is full of people sitting in the churches today who's lost as they can be because they've never been born of God's Spirit. They may be religious, but they're not saved. Why? Because they have not been born of God's Spirit. Because they're constantly, constantly just never being able to let the life of Jesus be revealed in them. People say, oh, if you just do good stuff. No, no. When you get born again, you'll do good stuff. It's hard to do good stuff and not be born again. You might do a few good things, but every now and again, you'll find yourself in an office mess several of us. It could be that the Spirit of God is not dwelling in you. Somebody needs to say amen right there. I mean, you help me just a little bit. I want us to know the truth because I find out that the Bible said, if I know the truth, truth makes me free. See, I only get freedom with truth. And I have to be willing to accept truth. You see, he says, look at John 14, 20. Jesus told him, said, at that day you shall know that I am in my Father. And you in me, and I in you. What day is he talking about? What day? Well, let me tell you what day. The day that they came on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God came from heaven and filled the house like a mighty rushing wind, and the Holy Ghost sat down on each of them. And they all of a sudden they realize I'm born from above, now I'm new. Listen, if you have not had that born again experience, you need to get born again. Well, I went through some religious experience. A lot of people have. It don't change nothing. It don't change eternity. What changes eternity? Do I have the life in, of Jesus in me? Do I have the life that Bethlehem birthed that day, that glorious day? Do I have the, has that life been birthed in me? Has that life been birthed in me? Is, is that radiance that's coming, that come into Bethlehem that day to save the world from their sins, has that life been birthed in me? That, see, that's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The new birth is obtained by faith. You say, how do you get that? Well, here's how you get it. You, you listen to the Word of God and, and faith builds up in you. The first thing you know that you know that you know that you know. The first experience you'll have is you'll say, well, maybe so. But then as, you, as your faith grows, then something, you see, Christ, Paul said, dwells in our hearts by faith. So how do you get that? You get it by studying the Word of God. Boy, when I got a hold of the fact that I'm clean. Yeah. Now, my past is kind of, there's some shady stuff. I've got a past. Am I proud of it? No. Am I going to brag about it? No. This morning, I told God, I wish I had got started as a young man. I wish I hadn't waited until I was middle-aged to get started on my road to my God, to get started where I were to commune with God and to worship God and to call out to His name and let Him have His life and let Him have His way in me. But I can't go back and fix that. God's grace is sufficient for us. So wherever we are, God picks us up from right there and takes us forward in Him because God's grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. I don't know what you went through this week, but God's grace is sufficient for you. You may have had a tough week. Some of you have been sick. A lot of people out sick today. 
sickness all over. The county schools are closed right now because of some sickness, you know. But let's tell you something. God's grace is sufficient. But see, it's the truth. It's faith and truth. It's what brings the fact to you. His birth in me is a glorious mystery. I, 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 I tell you. Paul said it like this. He said, he revealed it as the mystery of all ages. Colossians 1, 27. Seven words. Listen, all down through the history of mankind, it's been, it was hid until Jesus came along. And Paul kind of opened it up for us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That hope is a sure hope. It's not just some kind of, I hope so, I hope so. That hope is a sure hope. But it's Christ in you. So why is it that we, sometimes we try, but we struggle to, oh, we want to live for God. Oh, we want to live. Oh, we try so hard. Why don't we just ride back by faith and say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. All I have is yours, Lord. I don't have much. And really, you don't. He don't want your old life because it stinks. He don't want your old heart because it's black. He wants to create a new heart in you. Amen. And he'll do that. Amen. See, that's the, whole, that's the whole thing. Listen, we've seen his birth in history and we've seen his birth. We should have realized by now his birth in you or in me. I hope you know for sure you're saved. I run into so many people don't know for sure. I, I just, I feel for them. I, I really do. And I, I try to help them come to the place to work. I sure hope you get that figured out. You know what I know they need? I know they need faith. I know they need to simply trust the Word of God because the Word of God says you are if you've trusted Jesus. And then I want you to look next. And his life manifested. His life manis manifested. See, his redemption has made this possible for us. His life manifested. You say, well, preacher, what are you saying? Here's what I'm trying to say. When people meet you, they should see the life of Jesus manifested in you. They should not have to wonder, are you saved or, are you, or anything? Oh, they should see something different about you. There's a radiance on you. There's something about you. That, what is it? It is the mighty glory and power of the Holy Spirit of God that has indwelled you and you can't hide it. If Jesus said, come and drink of this water I've got, then it'll be like a river flowing out of you. It, it'll be like a river flowing out of you. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that, that flow of the Spirit of God. It's Jesus himself being manifest out through you. Amen. His life being manifest out through you. Let's look at 2 Corinthians. I, I, wanna, I, I wanted to cover about five verses here. It's just so beautiful. I, I love this passage Paul wrote. Notice he says there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. He said, if any man... Be in Christ. He's a new creature. How do I know I've got Jesus in me? Because I'm not what I used to be. Somebody asked me, can you prove God? I said, yeah, I can. I know, I know for me, I can't prove it for you, but I know for me, I'm not what I used to be. I don't think like I used to think. I don't act like you used to act. I don't do the things I used to do. Why? Because I am different now. I am born anew of God. A new creature in Christ. He says all things become new. That's a change right there. Didn't say some, some of the old stuff hanging around, that's not Bible. And that's what we've got to get rid of. And he says, and all things are of God. Who hath, notice this, reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, his life is what made this possible, made to us. And hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Notice what Paul says now. If you're serious in Christ, then you have the ministry of reconciliation. If the life of Jesus in you, 
Oh, I can't witness. Yes, you can. You are a witness. You can't help but be a witness. Why? Because the life of Jesus is in you. Paul said, now, then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. What is our message? Our message to the world is, listen, you don't have to die and go to hell. Be reconciled to God. Jesus has prepared the way. You come be reconciled to God. That's the message. You, 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 come in, you come in to God. Notice what he says in verse 21. For he hath made him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us. Jesus became my sin. He went to the cross and died to pay my sin debt. And then he arose. When he arose, that means my sins are gone. I, I hope, I hope, I hope to get. Who knew no sin? See, he didn't know any sin. He took my sin to the cross. Why did he do that? That we might be made the righteousness of God. How? In Christ. What I'm saying to you is. How can I say it any simpler? Just let me ask you a couple of questions. In conclusion, his birth in history we've seen, his birth in you we've seen, his life is manifested now. So scripturally that's all settled. But here's my question. And here's the whole point to what I wanted to say to you today. I hope you understand that Bethlehem, though it was small, it wasn't worth much. Out of Bethlehem come the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He could have been born in Jerusalem, in Athens, Greece, in Rome, anywhere God born in a palace. No, he was born in a cave, in that manger with the cattle. Yeah. The Son of God in Bethlehem. Son, that gets down to where I am. It gets down to the scum where I belong. But out of that was born the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now my question is to you, are you willing to be a Bethlehem? Are you willing to let the Son of God be birthed in you and live his life out and project his life out in you and through you? Are you willing to accept by faith this glorious thing that God's done. Now I'm going to tell you, I know we spend a lot of time on our troubles and cares of this life. But once you relinquish all this to Jesus and you lay everything on the altar, God, I'm yours, you'll find that your problems, your troubles, your cares will get so much less. The cares of this world seem to just like die out almost because your focus is on the Lord Jesus Christ and your focus is on Him and the glory because let me tell you something, even though this world is in a turmoil mess and these leaders of nations is going, ever, going war after war, rumors of wars, it'll always be that way. But one has come on the scene that's changing all that. He's coming back one day and he's setting up his kingdom on this earth and he's ruling and reigning. My question is, are you gonna be with him?